So now that you've known more about the initiative, let's kick start our session today with the CEO uh, of Nawaya Scientific from the CEO perspective. Uh, he will take you through uh, the journey of how he led um, his company uh, through the crisis, leading people, leading the strategy, leading the cash and so on. Uh, we'd love to have this session as interactive as possible. So for everyone who's watching us on Zoom and on Facebook, uh, you can leave your questions in the comments section and on the Q&A section. Um, so I'll leave uh, the floor for Omar for 30 minutes and I'll be back to discuss the questions and the answers with you, Omar. Very excited to hear from you and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Farida. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, good morning, uh, whatever you're uh, dialing in from. Uh, I guess this is one of the beautiful things about uh, webinars that people can really come from different locations and uh, we can uh, share ideas and thoughts with people from all uh, the world together. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, Rise Up and um, AMPI for co-hosting and co-organizing uh, this session. Um, I just want to start by saying that we're all in this together. What is happening now to the world is literally a black swan, something that is very rare to happen. And therefore there is no um, clear and let's say a holy book on what to do. Uh, so therefore comes the beauty of these sessions where people come and share uh, what have they done, uh, what did work and what did not work. So let's consider this as uh, an early disclaimer that I'll be sharing my thoughts and my early experiences. Um, I'm working in one industry, probably different industries would have different dynamics and um, definitely, uh, get your knowledge from so many different people, combine them together, and then as the leader of your startup, you should choose what works for you. Uh, let me start by introducing a little bit about myself. My name is uh, Omar Sakr. I'm a pharmacist by training. Um, through my very first years of uh, career, I was an academic, so um, a typical research assistant at the university. Then I got my master's degree, I became um, a lecturer, and then my PhD degree from the University of Geneva. I'm specialized in pharmaceutical sciences and more of a uh, specialty in nanotechnology. At that time of, of, of my studies, I, be, I fall in love with business. So I went to London to study my MBA uh, at Health Business School. And then in 2015, I came back to Egypt uh, to start uh, Nawawa Scientific. Um, today, um, I designed the whole um, webinar to go through this content. So I will be start uh, starting uh, start to talking about uh, Nawa Scientific. So what is our journey? Uh, what are uh, what are we actually doing? Then I will take you through the highlights of our uh, AMPI journey uh, and how did we manage to to get there. Then I will put most of my talk related to the title of this meeting, which is leading through crisis. I divided the tips and tricks into four major categories, leading people, leading cash, leading strategy, and finally leading execution. Okay, so oh, let me give you a brief note about uh, what is now scientific. Falls down to this story. So if you're coming from Africa, mostly as I guess, you would know that Africa has more than 2 million African scientists working in the fields of natural and medical sciences. Mostly they are bright-minded. We have so many people who have studied outside of Africa in top universities all over the world, and they're just coming back uh, to their countries. Problem is those, this huge number of scientists are only offered uh, a bunch of insufficient and outdated research facilities. And therefore, what happens now is we have to outsource a lot of scientific experiments we're doing in Africa to labs in Europe or to the US, and therefore wasting time and money and not producing um, the targeted uh, high quality scientific output. This is the main reason why the scientific research in Africa is held captive. We don't have problems with 
uh, the human caliber, we have problems with equipment and of course with funding. The same problem, in fact, grows even to companies. So I'm not only speaking about academic research, I'm also referring to R&D activities in companies. Let it be pharma companies, food companies, um, agriculture, um, you, you name it. Most of the tests what we have to outsource to uh, Europe and the US for analysis. Now, together with my team, we believe we can solve both problems and offer high quality scientific research in less time and at lower cost. This is how Nawa was born. And uh, uh, Nawa is the Arabic word for the nucleus, if you're not an Arabic speaker. So you can now relate to the name. So we're the nucleus uh, of scientific research. Uh, or this is what we uh, envision ourselves to be. We are a central hub of high-tech lab equipment manned by world-class researchers and we offer our services online and on demand. Let me show you how. Uh, these are a couple of uh, photos from now on, so you can see uh, my dedicated team working doing some really high-tech uh, um, scientific experiments. This is our business model. So, if you are a um, professor at one university, or even if you're a company, or even a family guy who wants to check caffeine in his coffee or gluten in the food of his kids, or probably a pharma company who wants to check the purity of their uh, chemical supplies, all you have to do is to log on to our website, and then you check the type of test to be carried. You click submit the task, uh, is already rec is automatically recorded and the courier is sent to pick up the samples and get it delivered to us at NAWA. Then NAWA team would do the analysis and send you the results all the way back to you through your personal account on our website. So the beautiful part of what we're doing is now regardless of your place and regardless of the equipment you have in your own lab, if you're working in a university, you can do amazing research, just depending on this uh, uh, platform and this business model. So whatever equipment or research facilities we bring to NAWA, it is by default spread to all uh, our customers. And we envision that by building a chain, now we're mainly, of course, operating in, in Egypt. We had plans to expand to North Africa this year, but we, of course, had to postpone because of the uh, Corona pandemic. But our uh, big vision is to have a chain of labs in major countries in Africa, very well connected together to empower the whole scientific community in Africa. We dream of the day that we unleash the full potential of African scientists, because we do believe that our problems can be solved by us, and we don't have to wait for scientists from the Western world to tackle our problems. This is not how things go. Um, moving on forward, uh, let me take you through uh, our journey with the um, African Entrepreneur Prize uh, competition last year. In fact, it all started back before then. Uh, it started with our connection with Rise Up in 2017. We won the first position of the uh, pitch competition. And I have to give credit for Rise Up. And for those of you, of course, who don't know Rise Up, Rise Up is the biggest uh, entrepreneurship summit across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, attended, uh, I guess, last year by 8,000 people. The competition is extremely fierce. In 2017, there has been like 500 competitors, contestants, and we made it to the first position. But the actual prize that we got from Rise Up was exposure. The thing is, we started in 2015. In two years, we could not um, raise significant uh, investment because VCs and angels were so susceptible, let's say, were so skeptical to invest in us till we made it to Rise Up. Through Rise Up, we passed through several layers of shortlisting and uh, judgments. And then when we made it to the first position, people started thinking, aha, maybe this company has something to offer. And then we raised our first uh, investment, our first professional investment uh, after Rise Up. So how does this connect to AMPI? Rise Up is the North uh, Africa partner of AMPI. I was on their um, email list. And in February, I got an email that there is a huge competition taking place all over Africa. And uh, the emails 
sounded like crazy because usually competitions are not that big and there should be sort of like uh, uh, specifications. Like we're used to competitions where it is specialized for fintech, agritech, biotech. The MPI competition was really borderless. You can apply whatever you are, whatever you're doing, and uh, the, only com the only condition was that you are creating an actual impact and solving an actual problem for Africa. And to add uh, uh, the hot sauce over the meal, the MPI final uh, stage is judged by Jack Ma himself. So this was crazy enough for me to uh, apply and uh, go through the journey. And we ended up winning the second position. So this is the summary of the journey. There has been more than 10,000 applicants, five stages of shortlisting. Uh, we started by a couple of, uh, um, say, uh, subscription, I mean, uh, submission of the initial uh, application, and then a couple of shortlisting uh, uh, online stages, and then the semifinals in uh, Nairobi, in Kenya, and then the finals in uh, Accra in Ghana. Uh, if my memory serves, this started in March and ended in November. So it has been like eight months or so of fierce competition and shortlisting. It's really a marathon and it, it takes like full breath um, to go through all of this. Uh, we were so, so humbled to get the second position, uh, meeting Jakma himself, uh, and we got the 150K prize. But I have to say the actual prize that you will get from your application to uh, Africa Business Heroes is not the cash money. It is this. So during those eight months of shortlisting, I had the time to meet a lot of people almost from everywhere in Africa. I made so well connections with uh, the top 50, the top 20, and the top 10 finalists. And they already opened my eyes to several opportunities out there in Africa. I had so many misconceptions about economies in Africa that were all now uh, corrected. And now I feel confident that at any point of time, when I decide to jump into another African companies, I have friends there. And this is very important. When you have true friends from the locals that you know before you start doing business, that you would, um, I mean, that you are friends with, regardless of any uh, uh, common or financial benefits, you have true friends on the ground. This makes you in a very, very good position to expand your business. So um, needless to mention, the amount of mentors and judges I have uh, met with, now you can collect amazing feedback because we really had to talk through uh, um, uh, we had to talk our uh, venture through uh, experts, especially at the, let's say, the top 50, top 20, and top 10. We had world-class judges uh, discussing our uh, business. We got amazing feedback. And definitely, I pick up, picked up on so many points uh, at that part uh, of the discussion and applied them uh, in our business model. If you made it somehow to even the top 10, I can guarantee you a massive exposure. Uh, this is me uh, in the um, opening session of the uh, Africa Investment Forum. This is the biggest um, African summit in, in Egypt where uh, the president is there, uh, VIP delegates and presidents from different African companies were there. And I had the time and exposure to tell my business to such a community. And you can guess what happens next. All TV channels come to you. Uh, you have interviews. You have um, you're, you're covered with the uh, press releases. So it is definitely a huge, a huge boost for for your business. And it doesn't stop there. Um, the guys from Alibaba and uh, AMPI Foundation are so um, great in keeping you connected through uh, WhatsApp groups, through, through uh, different social channels. And uh, we always feel that we're, um, we're still there, we're still so connected. I can give you an example with this corona pandemic going uh, out there. there has, we were offered so many survival sessions 
we were so we were offered uh, um, help uh, coaching uh, coaching opportunities. And I can tell that couple of lessons that I'm sharing with you guys now were already picked from uh, a survival session by uh, Alibaba experts. So uh, if I can say something here, it's definitely please join the um, experience of going through this marathon of uh, shortlisting is definitely worth it. Okay, now let's, let's focus now on, on the topic of, of our meeting today. We are, as startup leaders, in a very tough situation. We are not leading corporates that sits on tons of cash in our bank accounts. We lack resources. And here are some facts about this COVID-19 pandemic. It is the worst global economic crisis of our time. Experts have mentioned that it surpassed what happened in 2008 and in 2000 with the uh, dot-com bubble. This is much worse. And there are some sectors that are severely in injured. Let's say um, travel business, tourism. Some are moderately injured. However, some business sectors are thriving. So you really have to, um, to know very well uh, what's happening to your business sector. There will be a huge job loss. So I will comment on this back on, but think a little bit more, think twice and, and think several times before you fire someone these days. You most probably wouldn't find a job. Um, more dramatically, this is a two-in-one crisis. We're not dealing with an economic crisis only. We're also dealing with a health crisis, which means your own life and the lives of the, those who you love and the lives of your team is on stake. Plus the whole economy crisis and the whole uh, um, um, recession taking place. So this is a two-in-one crisis, which makes it even more uh, uh, hard to navigate. Unfortunately, this is staying for some time. So according to the WHO last statements, we're still not so sure about a second wave. We're not so sure about a mutation in the virus. And unfortunately, the virus has proved himself not to be susceptible to heat. I was one, uh, I mean, I had the hope that this virus, like other viruses, would die by uh, um, excessive heat because it's, it's lipid nature. But however, this uh, <laughs> crazy virus can somehow withstand heat uh, up to 65 degrees centigrade, which makes it, um, immune even to, to the desert. Okay, even when, the, when we get a solution for that virus, the recovery of the global economy will still take some more time um, to uh, re, uh, let's say, to pick up. It will take some time. And as I started saying, we're leading startups, we lack resources, so uh, it's not so hard to, uh, I mean, it is very hard uh, to lead at this times. but this is where great leaders would step on and make history. I categorized um, the different tips I would like to share with you uh, for leading through this crisis into four categories. As I told you, leading people, leading cash, leading strategy, and leading execution. Let's start by the part of uh, or related to leading people. You have to admit that people comes first. They always do before Corona and after Corona. But now it is the time where you check your beliefs. Now, please be reminded that the health of your people takes precedence over the health of your business. It doesn't make any sense to push people to work hard. Uh, and it's not about hardness of work. It is about take risk on their health and then you would lose uh, uh, great assets to your team. I hope no one would ever uh, witness such a bad accident, but don't risk the risks of your people. Don't risk the life and health of your people. Nobody signed to put their life uh, or the lives of their loved ones on the line for your company. This is not what they uh, uh, signed up for. Now, every one of us have been taught to create a company culture and core values. I hope you guys have done this already because this is the time when you bring this company culture and core values alive. Now, 
at NOAA, our core values are simple three words, family, integrity, and excellence. The core values serve as a filter through which you pass your decisions. And your decisions have to fit with your core values. Let me give you an example. Since we say we're a family, uh, it makes no sense to fire someone at this part uh, of, the, of, of, of time because they will not find jobs uh, easily these days. So I already had plans, in fact, to do some, uh, let's say, uh, changes. Uh, some people were not performing uh, to the best of my expectations. And I have already sent them warnings, but now I have sent them that uh, this pandemic has given them a uh, life kiss and they are given a second opportunity. In fact, it's not second, it's like fifth opportunity to prove themselves uh, worthy and keep their jobs. But definitely please try at least as much as possible, do not find people at this part uh, of the year. Um, also, when we were speaking about leading people, this is the time where communication skills uh, are key. You have to communicate candidly, comprehensive, uh, 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 comprehensively, and widely. You have to be uh, very honest with uh, your team, your investors, your stakeholders, and even your clients. Every stakeholder needs to understand what's being done to preserve the company. The correct dissemination of information brings people together on one page and facilitates the second point, which is taking hard decision, because you will have to. Um, as we will discuss in a few slides, there will be cash cuts, salary cuts, um, possible putting people on, on ice, if not firing them. I hope you don't. But so many hard decisions are coming, uh, typically with this type of, of, of crisis. Now, the best way to do this is to get a buy-in. And to get a buy-in, which means everyone agreeing or at least understanding why you took such decisions, you cannot do so if you are not communicating effectively and spreading uh, uh, correct information in a timely manner. So in, in NAWA, for instance, we had to cut everyone's uh, uh, salary by 20%. So we moved everyone from working 100% to 80%. Um, I know people wouldn't be so happy with such a decision. It is a hard decision for me and for uh, the team. But to get a buy-in, I started first communicating the challenges we're uh, facing, the decrease in demand. I, I forgot to tell you that we were one of the companies that took a hit because uh, now the universities are closed, research is uh, on ice, unless you're working with uh, COVID-19 uh, therapeutics or diagnostics. Uh, we're lucky a bit to have uh, contracts with companies that are still feeding our uh, cash uh, um, uh, pipeline, but we definitely took, took a hit, took a hit of about 30 to 40% uh, less in demand. So you have to communicate those stories to your team. Um, you cannot tell them that um, life is good, we're fine, uh, hoping that this will keep their spirits up. In fact, truth is the thing what keeps spirits up. Because if you tell them today we're having a 40% less demand, tomorrow this has uh, been improved even by 5%, then their spirits will go up because they're witnessing arise in demand. But if you keep telling them, we're fine, we're fine, they will feel it. They are the ones who are working on the ground, meeting the clients. They will definitely feel the demand uh, uh, going down. Also, a tip here to get a buy-in for your hard decisions is to cascade the decision rather than throwing a stone into the pool, which means, now, uh, this is a simple concept in change management. For any new decision, there are people who are so-called change champions. Those are the ones that you can easily convince with the changes you're going to make, especially the hard ones, like changing the company structure or changing the business model or changing uh, the way things have been done for years. Talk to those people first. 
get them into your site, make allies, and then cascade to the next layer, which are people who would usually um, think a little bit more, uh, let's say, would argue more, win them, and then go public with the rest of the company. Uh, I would advise against sending an email to everyone at the same time with uh, full harsh decisions and like a bump or a stone into the pool. This is not the correct things to do. Also, it, um, I mean, in any company, there is hierarchy, right? So there is you and there is like section heads, division heads, whatever you call it, and then the team leaders and then the teams. It is not good to inform the team leaders and the teams in the same email. Get the team leaders, get the top management first, get the buy-in and then cascade uh, in this manner uh, so that you have this buy-in uh, for your top decisions. Now, this is uh, the last point. I mean, in this slide is extremely, extremely crucial. Be honest, 100%. So under no circumstances, you should communicate a fraud information because this will destroy you as a leader for good. People will always remember that uh, upon stress, you twisted the story and you communicated a fraud information. And at the minimum, you will spread the culture that this is acceptable in other uh, conditions. And therefore you might expect people to start twisting information when they become stressed. So lead by example. Now you are the one uh, under uh, the stress. So by all means, uh, try to be very honest and communicate 100% uh, accurate information to the best of your knowledge. And I use this word a lot when, when I communicate uh, sensitive stuff. Uh, at times of uncertainty, I say, to the best of my knowledge, one, two, three, A, B, C, this is what I'm doing. So that at least if my information were wrong, um, I prove to everyone that I'm seeking honesty and seeking transparency. So this was the first pillar. The second pillar is about leading cash. Now here when it gets a little bit more tough, um, let's say you have to seek maximum cost control. Uh, it is the ideal time to revise every process and optimize your expenditure. Now, let's say um, in normal times, uh, you would focus more of your time on, uh, on growth, on um, acquiring new customers, growing your business into different cities and then probably countries, uh, uh, jurisdictions. But now it is the time to slow down and revise every single step of your operations and seek cost control. Seek efficiency, automate whenever possible. Think of, think lean, if you know what, what this term means. Lean means revising every single step of your operation and asking yourself, is this the best way to do it or I can do it better than this? And the lean terminology, I guess, goes back to uh, Toyota in the 60s of the last century when they, um, uh, dramatically thought of their uh, industrial process to the extent that they were thinking of every step. Let's say if you're, if you're a mechanic doing, doing a, a process, would your tools be on your right hand side or your left hand side? So if it gives you one extra second to have it on your right, right hand side, it should not be on your left hand side. This level of revision of your process is extremely important to seek cost control and of course, um, as we usually say, bootstrapping rules apply. Uh, for those of you who doesn't know the term of bootstrapping, this is something uh, um, like a terminology used by startups when they start. Um, it refers to using your resources to the maximum, maximum output and delaying the, uh, uh, delaying getting investment from outside to the maximum point. In simple words, the rules are never buy uh, 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 a new device when you can get it second hand, never buy a second hand when you can rent, never rent what you can borrow, and for fun we say 
never borrow what you can steal. Of course, I'm kidding. But this is the mentality of thinking of your resources very deeply. Uh, even if you're an established company, rethink bootstrapping. It's a mindset of every dollar counts and let's make the best use of our resources. Okay, now we come to the uh, hard part of salary cut. Unfortunately, and to so many startups, especially working in the tech industry, salaries are by far the biggest uh, tranche of your um, monthly expenses. You're not producing, so you don't have cogs, you, are, you don't have raw material. Uh, you're spending mostly on salaries and probably you're paying high salaries to developers to keep them and retain them into your uh, company. So when we speak about seeking maximum control over cash and cutting cash expenditure, you would definitely think of doing a salary cut. So unfortunately, it is inevitable in so many cases. So please do it elegantly. Don't fire if possible. I commented on this part because people won't find jobs. The elegant part of doing a salary cut is to do it across the company. Start with yourself and announce this to public, to, uh, I mean, to your team. Um, what we did is we cut more from uh, the top positions and cut less from the uh, uh, lower positions in the company because the top positions can survive with uh, a significant cut of their uh, um, uh, salary. Because let's be honest, we are playing now a survival game. It's not time for luxury outings. It's not time for uh, travels. It is time for survival. So the top management would definitely survive with a significant cut of their salaries. However, the uh, labor or the if you have blue collars, if you have um, not so high paid uh, uh, individuals in your team, you might think of not cutting salaries at all or even cutting a very, very small percentage of their salary because every dollar to them matters. Every hundred Egyptian pounds, hundred uh, rubies, hundred dollars, hundred rands, whatever your currency is, um, it matters and it matters a lot. So this would be my advice on how would you cut um, uh, salaries, do it across the company, do it publicly so everyone knows that starting by yourself, you lost a significant cut of your salary and then no one would probably come and argue, why are you cutting my salary? And this falls very well with the uh, couple of slides we mentioned before, where you precede this decision with dissemination of information about the decrease in demand, the decrease, uh, what's the market, uh, market dynamics uh, happening out there. So if people are well informed, this decision would uh, pass, I wouldn't say uh, with no pain, but let's say with less pain, as much as possible. Continuing to discuss uh, what you can do with cash. Um, think of sales and marketing budgets. This comes after uh, the salaries, of course. Uh, it is not time to spend a lot of money on uh, general awareness and branding campaigns. However, keep putting money in revenue generating sales. Now, every one of us knows what is uh, um, sales channels. Usually, you know the channels that are making most of your sales. And after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, probably this arrangement uh, I mean, this order of, of channels have slightly changed, but in any, in any case, you know which channel brings you most of your sales. This is where you have to focus your expenditure and stop spending on other channels for now. So if you know that when you spend a pound or a dollar in one channel, it will generate three or four or five or ten dollars, keep spending there because you want to keep generating cash and revenues. And please stop non-revenue generating uh, sales. This is very important at this part um, of, of, of time. Another trick is try to negotiate. You will be surprised. Um, I guess many of us have, I mean, 
haven't thought of, of negotiating with people like their landlords. Uh, we had um, a, a social uh, uh, experiment led by one of my friends. So he went to his uh, Facebook page, he's, he's a great influencer in, in Egypt, and advised startups to negotiate the rent with their landlords and to write down the experience in comments below his post. Amazingly, about, I'm not sure of the numbers, but probably 70% or 80% got uh, better terms from their landlords. Because people in these days are uh, showing a remarkable degree of empathy. Some landlords said, okay guys, you have been so good to us. Why not we drop one month of rent? Or why not we postpone rent? So in three months, you pay the whole three months together or uh, pay us what you can for now and uh, uh, pay the rest when, when you have money. And as the proverb says, you will never know if you never ask. So try to negotiate payment terms, try to negotiate payment terms with your landlords, with your suppliers, try to get a bit more relaxed terms. Uh, if you're dealing with big companies, they have also tendency to um, have, let's say cash and capacity to give you some, uh, uh, let's say, decent terms, or at least uh, we hope so. So at least try, give it a try, negotiate uh, your deals, negotiate your uh, rents, and uh, this uh, one way or another might uh, help you survive. Okay, now we cannot discuss leading cash without discussing fundraising. Um, I have been in this hard situation um, starting this year because we plan to raise our Series A in 2020. And uh, we wanted to leverage the winning of last year uh, Alibaba competition, the MPI, as well as the huge PR campaign, uh, I mean, PR uh, exposure we had. So we went to talk to VCs from all over the globe. We started discussions in January, uh, by, let's say in December. By February, the crisis has gone crazy, uh, jumping from between countries. And I can tell you that investment, I mean, investors are getting more cautious. Uh, they now tend to postpone bigger rounds investments are getting uh, uh, scarcer, and unfortunately, valuations are going down. So as usual, it's a matter of supply and demand. So many startups are seeking investment, and investors are making use of this increase in demand, so they're getting valuations down. So if you put together the, those three points, low amounts of money available, investors are more cautious and valuations are going down, I would advise you it is not the time to do big rounds. Think of raising um, small amounts of money that would, serve, would make you survive through the pandemic and probably to, let's say, um, mid of, of 2021. This, is, uh, this should be uh, uh, sufficient for you to raise a better round uh, next year on a better valuation. But if you, raise, if you raise a big round this year, in most cases, I guess you would sacrifice a significant portion of your stake. So I wouldn't advise on doing that uh, in 2020. However, there is one more trick. Consider convertible notes. So uh, for those of you who doesn't know what is convertible, what are convertible notes, um, it is a simple way of, of getting uh, investment. It starts like this. You go to the investor and you usually start by negotiating the valuation of your company. And after you get the valuation discussion done, you start discussing how much he's going to pay. So let's say your company worth $5 million and you're selling 20% of your company. So you're raising $1 million. Just sim as simple as that. In this part, uh, I mean, during these days, you would expect the investor to come harsh on you and tell you, no, 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 $500, uh, five, $5 million too much. Your worth only is $3 million. So if you sell one, if you raise $1 million over uh, uh, three, this means you're selling 33% of your company, which is way too much. 
for a single round. Now comes the trick of convertible notes. You would tell him, okay, um, let's do something that is mutually benefic beneficial for both of us. We will use uh, a convertible note setup in which you will give me the $1 million and then in two years time, those $1 million will convert from a loan to shares. And in two, in two years time, I will be raising my second round of investment. So by that time, let's say if, now, now as I told you in the example, you, were, you guys were discussing three to five uh, million valuation. You would set the cap on five and set, let's say a bottom on three. If, the, if your company in two years would be valued above five million, this means at this point of time, you were at five million. So you were correct. If in two years time, you were, let's say four or $3 million, this means you were definitely not at $5 million today. Therefore, in two years time, the, uh, the $1 million that you got will convert on, uh, the, uh, on a valuation that is between the cap and bottom. So in best case, you will convert on five, which was your request. If you didn't get five, you will convert on four million or three million dollars, and then the investor will get uh, a higher stake in your company, which was um, fairly true to him. The whole technique, um, you can Google the terms safe note and kiss note. Those are typical terms. Most of the investors already know the, uh, the, these deals. And I would say they have appetite uh, to uh, this sort of investment these days because it is less risky for the investor. It postpones the discussion of the valuation a couple of years forward. So you're not arguing now about how much you're valued. You're arguing about other stuff, about the business model itself, about the, the team, the operations, how you're going to survive. And if the investor really likes you, he would like the idea to do a convertible note with you because um, it will preserve his right to the correct valuation anyway. If your valuation is high, then he's fine. If, he, if his valuation was correct, he will get better share in your uh, um, company. So uh, just keep it in consideration. This is a good card to play with investors. Uh, and as I told you to summarize this slide, do not go for big rounds in 2020. Go for bridge rounds, survive, and then uh, preserve your valuation for uh, uh, next year. Okay, moving on, let's, about, let's talk about leading a strategy. Um, as we touched uh, upon this topic, think survival, uh, this is the time where companies die or go bankrupt. So it is time for short-term tactics. There is nothing wrong about that. Go for low-hanging fruits. Think of uh, easy revenue streams. And I would like to recall this very nice example. I don't know uh, if this is happening uh, elsewhere, but here in Egypt, we have uh, by the government dec decree, the restaurants closed. Only uh, a delivery option is, uh, uh, is available. So for those restaurants who used to offer only a dine-in experience with no delivery, um, they came up with the idea of selling their uncooked ingredients. So if you like Afton restaurant, because they offer an amazingly, let's say, uh, cooked pasta for innocence. And uh, also by the way, people are a little bit afraid, although this is not so much correct, of buying fruit from outside um, with the fear that this will transfer the, the, the coronavirus. The coronavirus does not, uh, is not infectious um, if, if taken in ingested food. The problem is we we'll touch the surfaces. Anyway, this is a different story. So this pasta restaurant that you love would send you the ingredients, the secret sauce altogether, and a recipe of how you can cook this at home. And then you can put their mix of uh, sauce, which made you love their pasta in the first place. And you would enjoy um, the meeting at the comfort of your home. So this is a very, very short-term te uh, technique. 
uh, because whenever the curfew would open again or the lockdown is removed, the uh, restaurant will open the dine-in space again. So there is nothing wrong of thinking about this. Think survival. It is okay also to pivot with, and by pivoting, we mean a long-term change in strategy, especially if you identified uh, an opportunity that will keep on even after the crisis time. I would also recall the um, uh, uh, example of conference organization uh, apps pivoting into the online conferencing industry. I do believe that after the crisis, people would, uh, let's say, become used to this environment of online meetings, and we will keep uh, uh, seeing events happening virtually. It is much less cost. It has been very efficient. People have got used to it. Um, we have seen major uh, fair trades are now taking place through Zoom or through other online communication tools. So even if things get back to normal, uh, this trend will not die. It will just level uh, level up. And uh, we have, we're, we're witnessing so many conference organization apps pivoting into online conferencing industry, which makes sense uh, because this way they are building uh, uh, value into their long-term uh, business. Some more uh, strategy uh, tips. Uh, please be agile. Now, the simple rule is doing something is better than doing nothing. At this time of uncertainty, you, you cannot bear the cost of being undecisive. You have to take decisions. It is uncertain, so make it snappy and make it quick. Think, but then be decisive. I can tell you uh, at NAWA, uh, we uh, identified an opportunity with this uh, whole uh, uh, pandemic thing, that people are keeping using alcohol-based sanitizers to clean their hands. And we know as scientists that alcohol will cause dehydration of the skin. So after some time, you would find your skin becoming more uh, dehydrated, white and scaly. And especially for ladies, this looks really not so good. For a lady who is taking care of her hand and uh, so cautious about the health of her skin. So early on, we decided, okay, let's go on and formulate a hand sanitizer that would preserve the uh, hydration level of the skin and at the same time do the sanitization uh, uh, task and kill the virus. So we um, had the discussion, did the formulation, did the experiments, designed the logo and the product, communicated to our sales channel, produced our first batch, sold our first batch in seven days. From idea to selling the first batch in seven days. So this was really, really agile, thanks to uh, the uh, dedicated team. Uh, it wasn't easy. We were working literally 24-7, uh, even with the curfew, working uh, both from home and from the lab. And a couple of people stayed in the lab overnight to uh, make this uh, happen. But this is the way you want to do things uh, in such times. Uh, flexibility. I guess we touched upon, upon this point several points. You need really to be flexible with your business model. It is okay to go for low-hanging fruits. It is okay to um, pivot on small, uh, on, on short-term opportunities or even on long-term opportunities. But you really have to rethink your business model. Creativity is key. Um, think of uh, uh, opportunities that come uh, disguised. Think of uh, um, things you have never thought of uh, before. And again, I really love this example of uh, restaurants selling their uh, uh, ingredients for us to cook them at home. I find this very, very creative. Okay, um, the last part, and I'll make this very short, is uh, leading execution. We touched already on so many points, just I want to do some highlights. At this part of managing your company, seek efficiency and not glamour. Um, uh, please uh, play cost leadership, and cost leadership is a strategy where you keep your prices like the market or even get them lower, 
But technically, you extend your market by decreasing your costs. Think again of every single step in your operations and see where you can cut a pound here, a pound there, a dollar here, a dollar there, and then here you go. Um, a very nice technique to use these days is the so-called soft acquisition, which means um, do not push hard on your clients to do sales now because everyone now is lacking resources and everyone is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, cash aware. So everyone's keeping cash for himself because he, he or she doesn't know what's coming on. So do not push hard for conversions to final customers, to sales, but push for soft acquisition, which means keep feeding people to the top of your funnel, create amazing content, bring people to your platform, bring people to your um, uh, uh, um, application, um, offer free stuff, um, stand by your people now, they will come to you later. By the way, this huge amount of webinars we're seeing out there is a technique of soft acquisition. So uh, people are uh, seeking a good and trustworthy uh, content. So if you're offering this now, this will bring people uh, to you and they will remember your brand. They will remember uh, what you have done uh, for them during the crisis time. Um, this would be my last point to comment on ethical and unethical measures. Uh, as we discussed, be kind and understanding with your customers because you're not the only, the only one suffering from cash issues. Also, your customers will be suffering from cash issues. And as I told you, negotiate with people, people will start negotiating with you. So find the right balance between those. Um, at Nawa, for instance, as we depend on uh, the sample pickup from different uh, locations, we wanted to keep people uh, at home, uh, I mean, or at least in their labs, so to reduce. Uh, so we have a segment of people who prefer to bring their samples to us. We wanted to push them towards our pickup uh, service. So we slashed all the fees over pickup, and now pickup is done for free. And we're bearing the cost of uh, sample pickup and people responded really, really well to this uh, offer. Uh, now, more people are sending samples, uh, almost 95% are sending samples through our sample pickup service. And because this service has grown, the cost per order has went down. So it paid back eventually to help people and uh, cut costs. On the contrary, please, please do not raise uh, uh, prices, uh, especially on needy uh, clients. If you're serving hospitals, of course, this is not the time to raise your, your uh, prices. If you're helping the um, uh, first responders or the doctors, the physicians, or the whole healthcare team, it is not time to make use of the crisis for your own benefit. I would rather, I mean, I, I would see this as uh, uh, um, a fully unethical maneuver to make more money out of needy people or needy segments um, in this uh, time, during these days. Give back as much as you can to your society. Uh, if it is for your, for your religious beliefs, it is, if it is for your thawab, if it is for good humanity, if it is for building a brand, there are so many reasons to give back to community these days, whatever your beliefs are. So please do it and it will pay off eventually uh, in the future. And giving back, back to the society can be everything between donation and if you're uh, low on cash, it, you can give back to society by just spreading correct information through your social channels, through your communication channels. Spreading a correct information might save the life of someone and you wouldn't know it, but it is there and it is very, very important. Last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. These are the times where we live by these words. We will survive. One day you will write in your CV, I led my company successfully through the crisis. 
thank you so much for your listening and your interest. I hope I didn't take too much time and therefore I'm open for questions. Farida, the floor is yours. Thank you, Omar, so much for your insights uh, and for the contents you delivered. Uh, I really uh, personally enjoyed it. We have a couple of questions. Uh, I'll start with the last one uh, from Hussein Ahmed. Um, he asked you in Arabic and he's uh, uh, thanking you for your efforts. Uh, however, he has a question um, about the sales engineers. Uh, he's saying that most of the time they are staying at home and they don't have a, a real value that they add uh, to the business because of uh, the corona. Uh, so he's asking you uh, for uh, an advice uh, and especially because they're working in the B2B um, sector. Okay, uh, so thanks Hussein for your uh, kind words. Now, uh, let me assume you're running your company. So you're the decision maker and you're work, working in, in a B2B and the sector is, is going down. I know it is tough if you have clients who are not uh, paying, but if you can survive with whatever cash you find, uh, you can, for the time being, for the time being, advise your uh, um, uh, team to, uh, to develop through uh, online courses or uh, something like this, or you can think of switching to online sales, if this helps. Uh, if you are working in one of those uh, sectors where the customers are totally uh, locked down, no sales, I know it's tough, but I <laughs> um, think of a pivot then. Think of changing your uh, uh, business model or go for a low hanging fruit. But by the way, one good technique is to offer courses for money. So. If your team, let's say, is, uh, has amazing talents with sales, offer sales course to uh, other people. So courses might be an unexpected revenue stream for you. Yeah, I wish you all the best. Yeah, we have another question from uh, Mahmoud Anwar. Uh, he's asking you, uh, as a business that is strongly relevant to the COVID-19 issue, um, how did you try to benefit from the current situation? And I think you uh, already discussed uh, parts on how uh, you made a new product uh, in these uh, times. Um, I'll, I'll skip this question and go for another one. Um, okay, someone is asking you, is it beneficial to enter the ANPI competition even if we're already operating and doing great? Yes, so very quick and short answer. The answer is yes, because even if you're doing uh, great, uh, you're thinking of expansion. And the AMPI would be your portal to expand in Africa. So if you're thinking of uh, jumping into the African market, this is the time to do so. Awesome. Um, okay, so someone else is uh, asking you, do you think the number of mergers will increase once SME or startups run out of their cash flow? What type of mergers do you think uh, would be beneficial? Okay, so this is a tough question because... Um, tough one. <laughs> yes, definitely. But this is the nature of life. So consolidation should take place. Uh, people who are competitors should sit together and think if we can merge our forces and merge our resources together. And it couldn't be done in a better time, to be honest, because uh, it is not like someone is giving up for someone else, like uh, losing for your competitor. Sit with your competitors uh, and think if you can um, uh, merge. And it is tough because everyone has built his own brand and everyone is looking for the survival of his brand. But this is the nature of, of things. Um, it is, uh, let's say, more beneficial to live and fight another day. Also, I think that it would be a, a nice or have a, um, a good effect uh, if competitors uh, collaborate in these times on their audience and uh, customers. I think people have this emo emotional uh, sense towards these kind of collaborations. Yes, indeed. So one thing competitors can do together is to work on increasing the market itself. I remember um, uh, this was a, 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 this is an example before the COVID-19 time, but it's very relevant here. Back in Egypt in 
uh, let's say 70s or 60s, where families were using um, towels for babies instead of diapers. We have several brands of diapers like Pampers and so on and so forth. They merged forces and launched huge campaigns funded by all of them to make the market more aware of the use of diapers instead of towels. So um, also this happened again, I guess, in the 90s, where milk companies have also together launched a campaign on the safety of bottled milk versus the um, uh, uh, fresh milk that is not boiled and that fresh milk can transport germs and microbes. So you can think with your competitors of something like this, expanding the market now just by spreading awareness. Okay, so uh, another one is asking from your experience, what advice can you tell someone trying to enter a huge market operated by big corporates? Okay, in this uh, context, I would definitely advise you to find a niche. A niche means a part of the market that you can offer uh, a great value than your competitors, although if it is a small part, okay? Um, let me give you an example about what Karim has did when he entered the market in the first place against Uber because before he became a giant. Karim went to a market that is dominated by a US giant called Uber and everyone over the globe knows who is Uber and Karim wanted to, uh, uh, to compete with this. What they did is they thought of the market really, really locally they introduced a few advantages that made us as locals in the Middle East relate and love them more over Uber. So if you're from the region, you would know that Karim were the first uh, ride hailing app to offer payment in cash. Wherever, uh, I mean, uh, Uber has been offering payment in, in, in credit cards. In Egypt, for instance, credit, uh, people who carry credit cards are not that many. I guess something between 7% and 10%. So really, um, not a lot of people are carrying uh, credit cards. Then Karim offered Karim wallet because if you are trading in cash, you will always have the problem of, uh, you know, small change and you need to give change to the driver or the driver gives change to you. So they invented the, the wallet. Those small changes made the uh, uh, Arabic segment or the local segment, those who don't have credit cards, those who want to pay in cash, would love more to use Karim over Uber, and then they took it over. So find a niche, find a small segment in the market that you can offer better than your competitors and take it from there. I think this is a very interesting insight on this. Um, we have another co um, question regarding the competition or the ANPI competition. Um, in most competitions, the benefit is the process itself more than winning because not everyone wins. Um, can you tell me the benefits of the process of the competition and what you've learned? Okay, I guess uh, this friend missed that part in, in my presentation. Yeah. So yeah, no, no, no worries. Uh, okay, in, in fact, there are three major important points or major benefits you would get from the MPI uh, on top of the cash prize should you get it. So first is the network, because during, it is like a marathon really. Uh, you will be um, competing with so many African contestants. I met a lot of people, I made a lot of friends, and uh, especially with the top 50, top 20, and then top 10 finalists. Now I feel secure that whenever I want to go uh, to an African country, I have friends there. I have local true advisors, who would tell me how to launch my company there. Also, this was eye-opening because I had so many misconceptions about the economies of certain African companies and my friends helped me to correct this. So this is number one, network. Second is um, uh, the feedback you get from the judges. Uh, AMPI really brings you top class uh, judges. So you get invaluable feedback. And I have already uh, put in place some advice that I got from those judges. Third is if you made it at least to top 20, uh, you will get a massive uh, public relation exposure. Uh, MPI is so well with us. Uh, they have a huge PR machine. Uh, you will be covered by press releases, uh, meetings, webinars. Uh, and since I made it to the top 10, I was even invited to um, 
a couple of the biggest Africa uh, or African uh, investment forums in front of Egyptian president and other uh, African presidents. So those three things, network, feedback, and exposure, you will get on top of the back price. Um, awesome. And by these uh, final words, we're going to conclude our session. Thank you so much, Omar, uh, for your time and effort. Also, we have some uh, attendees from Tunis, uh, and Tunisia who are uh, saying, yes, the network is key. Uh, so yeah, the network is key. And for everyone who's, uh, who wants to apply for uh, ANPI, uh, I'm going to share with you a very short video on how to apply for the competition. Um, and we encourage everyone who's uh, in, in Africa and has um, a startup that has been operating for three years to apply in this competition. Finally, thank you so much, Omar. Uh, thank yeah. you for your time. Thank you, Farida, uh, and thank you for the attendees for their time. And uh, I wish everyone a happy Ramadan if you're uh, in this part of the world. And um, uh, happy Easter, uh, wherever you are. And stay safe. And uh, thank you, Rise Up and NPI for the organization. Thank you, Omar. I'll share with you guys now the uh, video and we'll conclude the session with this one. We see you, African entrepreneur, and now the world needs to see you too. Are you ready to be a 2020 ANPI Africa's business hero? Are you an African entrepreneur? Is your business at least three years old? Are you ready to pitch your business to legends and tell your story? If you said yes to all these questions, it's your turn to apply now. Follow these five quick easy steps to start your journey to becoming an ANPI business hero. Step one, set up an account, fill in your details, click register and you are one step in. Step two, read the guidelines carefully. Just visit africabusinessheroes.org and click on application guide. Step three, the criteria for eligibility. Simple, each applicant should be a founder or co-founder of the company. The applicant has African citizenship or is a direct descendant of an African citizen. Your company has to be registered, headquartered and operated in an African country. Your company should be at its post-idea stage. Your business should be three years old or more and has at least three years of revenue history. Step four, get a reference. It could be your mentor, colleague, teacher, or advisor. And finally, step five, submit your application. Your application includes these five sections. Founder profile, business profile, business deep dive, awards and recognition, and a video introduction. If you get stuck at any point, don't worry. Visit our application guide and frequently ask questions for help or send an email to info at africabusinessheroes.org. Now, it's your turn to become a 2020 ANPI business hero and win a share of $1.5 million. Admission into the Alibaba eFounders Fellowship, access to mentorship and training, and a chance to tell your story to Africa and the world. Apply now. Thank you everyone for tuning in uh, and hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions regarding uh, ANPI application process, please ask them um, on our Facebook page or uh, to ANPI directly. Uh, we are going also to broadcast another, another session next um, Saturday. So stay tuned for more information on it uh, through our social media channels. Thank you so much everyone and have a good day. Bye.